Welcome to Brewing TV, everybody. I'm your host, Michael Dawson. Jake Keeler is on assignment this week, and I'm taking it down a notch. Just doing a little relaxing stovetop extract brew. I'm making a Kolmbacher. It's a dark lager. Not quite enough there to be a full-fledged Bach, but a little too much to be a Munich Dunkel. My recipe came from this book, Treatise on Lager Beers. I updated it a little bit for 21st century ingredients and availability, but I really felt like getting back to my roots. And this book was published long before I started homebrewing. To be totally honest, it was published before I was born. To be even more precise, it was published about 10 years before homebrewing was legalized in America. The author, Mr. Fred Eckhart the man who Charlie Papazian has called his guru, the man who is credited by folks like Rob and Kurt from Widmer Brothers and Mark Stutrud from Summit with bringing back good beer to America, both homebrew and craft. We were fortunate enough earlier this year to sit down with Fred over a few pints at the Horse Brass Pub in Portland, Oregon, and talk with him about the history of beer, the history of homebrew, his role in both of those and where he sees craft beer and homebrew heading in the future. Sit back, grab a pint, and prepare to take notes, 21st century homebrewers, because the history of Fred Eckhart's homebrew is the history of your homebrew. All for brew, and this week please join me in brewing one for Fred. Cheers. We can just add lib it. I can I can add lib the beginning of it because you won't know the right questions to ask. Okay. Beer has always been America's major alcohol consumption point. Uh, from you know the Pilgrims landed here because they ran out of beer on their boat, and they land they were landed. They didn't land. They were landed because they weren't the people on the boat were heading for more beer. These people were just causing trouble and slowing them down. So they dumped them off Plymouth Rock, and uh, and they were left to their own devices until they figured out how to make beer. You know, as as time went by, beer became uh, pretty good. Um, 1846, we had the introduction of uh, from from Europe. We had the introduction of uh, Pilsner Pilsner Urquell, the uh, original. Lager beer, so you had you had this one type of beer that eventually took over the world of brewing everywhere: Germany, Spain, China, France, even uh, uh, wretched places like uh, Minnesota. <laughs> we were full of German immigrants, and so we were quick to yeah. surrender to the pale lager craze. Up until then, we had had ales, for example, that are fairly aggressive in taste. Yeah. They have a lot of taste factors. We, right now we're having an ale, an ale return, and we love that taste factor. There were two kinds of beer out there after the war. Light beer, as in light colored beer, and dark beer, as in dark colored beer. Like that in was the only dark difference lager and light, light lager, really all you had. Was the only difference between the two was the color. Basically, yeah. The dark beer, they would put in some caramel flavoring, or some caramel coloring, and that was their dark beer. They didn't care, and uh, they wanted to sell beer. Well, I don't blame them for that, but the point is that you didn't get much of a variety out of that. And there was a third kind available. Uh, it was called it was called ale, and you couldn't find it very often. The, the humorous part of all this is that people like my father kept on brewing home brew because his beer t had a distinctive character to it. That's that's famous for being what is called what was called home brew in those days. So now you had you had people like my father still brewing beer, giving home brew a bad name. And you had the brewers doing uh, wretched beer really and and giving everybody a bad name in the in the beer department. It's my father's home brew, you put uh, one three and a half pound can of malt extract, ten gallons of water, uh, ten pounds of sugar some yeast, and it, it, would, it would begin fermenting. 
And when it was finished, it, th there would be a circle of bubbles, and they bottled it, and they put a teaspoon of sugar in each bottle. Mm -hmm. Well, that teaspoon of sugar is okay if you've got the right amount, but if you don't have the right amount, the bottle will explode or the cap will explode, which caused a lot of trouble. One time, I accidentally, I, w I must have been about 13 or 14 at the time, I accidentally kicked one of my, bo my father's bottles of beer and the cap exploded and there was beer all over the place so I hid and my father got the blame for that and my mother was off my case for weeks so, so I knew how to help out there. <laughs> when was the first time you well, made your Well, it was after I, had been, after I had been brewing uh, wine for a while I thought, geez, maybe I should try home brew. I knew better from my father's recipe but just uh -huh. the same I thought maybe I should try home brew anyway. And that's actually what I ended up doing because I found a recipe that, in, that made those different wine things fall into beer. Okay. So you had primary ferment in an open container, then you had secondary ferment in a closed uh, carboy, for example. Yep. Yeah. And then maybe racking it to another secondary to, after you cleared it, mm -hmm. and then finally bottling. And this recipe had all that in there. Not only that, but there wasn't just malt extract and sugar malt extract and some sugar and some extra grains and you could get genuine hops. Ooh, <laughs> you could actually make beer at home. Can you tell us in two or three sentences what your first batch was like? Very good. It was very good. And blew my mind because I didn't expect good beer. That's three sentences. <laughs> <laughs> I found a book, 1934, by Nowak, who put his book out when the war was over, and, and had spent a great deal of time telling new brewers that were coming out in 1934, telling them how to make beer. And we were following those same procedures. We so you, couldn't lose. You had to go and do some primary research on old texts that yeah. were aimed at professional yeah, exactly. brewers. Yeah. Wow. So you, there was no groundwork for you to build on. You couldn't go to the internet and no. look up John Palmer's I How had, to Brew. I did or, have this, this wonderful Canadian recipe yeah. that allowed for all of these things. And the beer turned out to be really good. So I took the, I took the recipe home because it was very poorly organized. And I rewrote it so that you actually could tell what to do and when to do it. And I took it back to the owner of the shop, Jack McCallum, who's since passed on. And uh, I, I said, you know, you, you, could, you could rewrite that recipe and it'd be a lot easier for people. And he said, why don't you write a book? And I thought, now that's the craziest thing anyone's ever put in my brain cells. What, what year was that? That would have been 1968. Okay. And I thought, why don't I write a book? And he said, write a book, we'll publish it. And then he didn't leave it go. He didn't just let me go wandering off into the countryside knowing better, he kept pestering me. First thing you know, I thought, well, okay, I'll write a book. <laughs> and I did. He named it. I had nothing to do with the name. Treatise on Lager Beer. It's a great, a great uh, actually, a great introduction to brewing because I had 33 different kinds of lager beer. By that time, nobody drank ale in this country. Well, hardly. It was... It was very unknown. Yeah. Yeah. But the whole, the whole point of it was that we, had, we were making a different thing. Now, um, some people in Colorado decided that what they really needed to do was to see what American beer consisted of. So they were, they had it, they put together a great American beer festival. That would have been about 1981 maybe or something like that. We'd been homebrewing for some time. But there was a whole lot of homebrewers out there. Mm -hmm. And when they all found out about this, they wanted to brew small breweries. So now we got a whole group of people making small breweries at that same time. Which hadn't been seen in America since before yeah, Prohibition. Exactly, right. And you have all these people, there was about a hundred of them there, talking and, and trying to figure out what, you know, we can open a small brewery and do better than this. So it wasn't long, another um, ten years or so, you had a whole you had a whole movement. And this is from the Brewers Association of Colorado, organized and put together by Charlie Papazian, who did an excellent job. 
he's the one that saved American beer. All I did was throw it up in the air and see if it came down on its two feet. <laughs> Who was your guru? My first batches, my guru was hope and a prayer, you know? <laughs> I had nothing except a little piece of paper for a jot of down from this old timer who gave me a, re a good recipe and I had tasted his two year old beer that would seem to be pretty good. And I said, oh, I wouldn't mind duplicating this stuff. And then I guess my, my first guru really was probably uh, Fred Eckhart came across his book, Treatise on Lager Beer, uh, which he came out with in the very early 70s. And, uh, you know, you know, he helped guide me. Fred was the uh, uh, original guy here in this country that had he, that was organized to publish, you know, he was publishing a little bulletin about home brewing yeah. and, and uh, you know, he had a, a small following of disciples and I, I guess I was one of them at the time. <laughs> well, you know, Fred Eckert, um, you know, he's, he's, he's one of a handful of people who worked on really incorporating some coherence in the hobby of home brewing. But in a lot of ways, he's um, like an Allen Ginsberg of home brewing to me. Allen Ginsberg. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Fred Eckhart, I don't think. He was out there when all these guys who are now professional brewers were home brewers trying to figure out how to go pro and make this happen for the first time before it was even legal before they had you know they had to go to the legislature and get it approved for them to brew professionally and everything like that he was out there talking about beer styles getting them to try new things he would go to the different breweries and um, um, you know, say, here, you've got to do this, you've got to try that. And I think it was mostly because he just wanted that style of beer. <laughs> he's never super altruistic, and he's very honest about it. <laughs> you know, uh, how he approaches his beer, I mean, he's the first guy who uh, uh, thought of this notion that you should listen to your beer before you even look at it. He was breaking down characteristics of, of beer that were never appreciated by a typical beer drinker. But he, what he wanted to do was just really have someone pay attention to it. And if he would use stream of consciousness to get that person there, so be it, he would do it. He's a treasure. I mean, you know, it's, it's so cool. We just celebrated his, I guess, 85th birthday. I think 85th birthday at Fred Fest. Yeah. He's just, you know, he's such an interesting character and he's been such a huge proponent of, of beer, you know, and home brewing and craft brewing and everything. I mean, I remember early on, before we even uh, were selling beer, he'd come by and, you know, we were, we really, you know, worshipped him at that, you know, and we were like, Fred, what do you think, what do you think, you know, and he'd always be like, well, I think it's great, but don't build a business off of what I think, you know. <laughs> but, you know, he's just such a, a great, colorful character. I mean, he hasn't aged a day in, in he's, 20 years. He's remarkable. He, he looks exactly the same as he did 20 years ago. And, and he, he's so positive. Yeah. He uh, used to, to write, or I guess two of the local publications here, write a column. And if he, if he didn't, it was the classic, if he didn't have something good to say, he just wouldn't say it, you know. So, uh, but when he'd cover a brewery, he'd find something good to say about them, you know. And, and you know, we all needed a little nurturing back in those day, early dark days. And, and uh, he was so positive. And, and, you know, if you've spent five minutes with him, you know that, that Fred would never say, you can't do that. Whether you're a home brewer or whether you're a commercial brewer, um, He'd be the last person in the room to say you, you you can't throw that into beer, you know, and call it beer, um, which is which is great to have like the like the guru of, of beer here in Portland, and then and then he's basically saying, always do whatever you want, you know. It's like okay. <laughs> so no, he's he's been a he's been it's been just fantastic having having him here, and he, and plus he's a fun guy. <laughs> he's one of the few people that we've given given a free uh, free beer for life card to in our in our pub, so. And it's, and it's dog eared. He was showing it to me, and he, he uses that sucker. I do think that um, I do think that maybe, if it wasn't for Fred Eckhart, I don't think that that Portland beer would be where it is today, and maybe not even American craft beer. So that's I. That's about it. Yeah. I can't keep up with Fred. I'm sorry. <laughs>
I can't keep up with me. <laughs> Worn out and in need of a beer, Dawson tagged out. Friend of Fred and Portland beer writer John Foyston tagged in. Uh, to get back to your question, why is uh, Portland Beervana? Fred, e Fred Eckhart is the I'm not, architect. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure I'll go along with that. Well, I do. He's, he's, uh, we're, we're, we're founded on people like Fred and who um, generously, uh, well, first off, he wrote those books that we all know about, and then he generously gave his time and energy to the beginning brewers. That, this kind of beer is destined to success. Mm -hmm. They've got breweries in China, the Far East, Japan, something like 300 microbreweries now. Wow. 300, that's a lot. Malaysia, almost any place you go on the planet, and the Budweiser people have painted themselves into an incredibly beautiful corner, but it's still a corner. <laughs> and what they are going to do is, is to hunt for us, because sooner or later, we're gonna save their beer. Yeah. Right now, Belgian breweries are crumbling, German breweries are crumbling, British breweries are crumbling, and yeah. the Bud Miller Coors people yeah. that we finally got out of the country, except the breweries are still here, those people are making beer and selling it to the young people of Europe who think it's great to be following the American ideal. When, when I was in Ireland in um, 05, I was shocked by the um, number of people drinking Budweiser in pubs. I mean, horrified just, would be the word. Yeah, horrified. <laughs> so there's still a lot of education to be done, but it'll, it'll happen. Meanwhile, it's, you know, we, we've got ours. <laughs> and we're all having too much fun, aren't we, John? That's right. <laughs> to too much fun, Brad. <laughs> I like that. We got ours. We got to get I suppose I should. Oh, I can't throw this out. But well, is, well, you've you've got yourself into a conundrum. You want some of this? I might. Yeah, yeah. Great. That's Thank all you, you get. That's all I get. Well, you could have a little more. No, no, that's fine. I that's wouldn't fine. want the neighbors to know. No, that's fine. <laughs> if you're gonna, if you're gonna be mean. I can't bring myself to throw this out. <laughs> Maybe I'll just add, well, first I gotta taste it. <laughs> this is under 4%? I think it's 4.5. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, what's the name of it? It's called uh, Daily Bread um, uh, Northwest Common. Yeah. Okay, I'm, 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 I cannot throw this out. There's just no way I can no. throw that out. I mean, I, that would be wrong. It makes a nice combination. 